Hi Awesome Blossoms, welcome back to my channel. I'm Anna. I have been thinking a lot about how to start this video. It's taken me a long time to gather my thoughts. I have been doing a lot of thinking and reading and just like meditating on a lot of, you know, the changes that have happened in our world, especially since George Floyd was killed. I felt like the best thing that I could do for me was to take a pause and really think about, you know, my life and ways that I could make changes to my life and also help the people around me as they um, dealt with a lot of the questions that they had and as we, you know, we would talk and have conversations. So that is sort of the reason why I haven't made a video um, since May. I feel like it has helped me a lot to figure out things that I need to figure out in my life. That being said, there are a couple things that I want to say about the changes that our world has gone gone through, specifically since May. Um, I think as we all know, um, the world is still roiling with turmoil, not just in America, pretty much so many different places in the world are dealing with their own forms of strife and tension and injustice. And it, it can be overwhelming to be faced with all of that and not know what to do and not know how to make changes or how to navigate all of the terrible things that we're seeing. And I don't have answers to that question. I struggle with that as well, of knowing what my place is in all of this. What am I supposed to be doing? And I remember reading something that Rainer Maria Rilke said about questions and it kind of goes along the lines of you don't always have to have the answers to your questions right away. Sometimes it's better that you don't because if you do your best to live your life in the best way possible, you know, learning, making changes for the things that need to be changed, acknowledging the hurts or of that, you know, you've caused others or others have caused you moving forward in forgiveness, all of those things. If you do your best to live your life to the best of your ability, sometimes, and these are his words, you'll live your way into the answers. And that really gave me hope because I think in our world, in our society, we have to know everything right now we have so much access we feel like there is no excuse for not knowing anything and that's not true for certain things yes i will say for things like injustice and racism and systematic oppression those are the things that we can raise our awareness of uh, acknowledge that they exist move forward and work towards changing them but sometimes for a lot of people, they are unsure of how they specifically are supposed to go about doing that. Making sure that what they're doing is equitable, making sure that where they're donating money is not going to perpetuate the same systems that they are trying to abolish. And so, yeah, it can be a lot. It is a lot. Uh, I know a lot of people in my family and friends who are, and myself included, who are dealing with anxiety. There's a lot of hurt a lot of confusion and pain and anger and it can sometimes feel like a tiring task to take it all on. I want to encourage you and also myself not to shy away from things that are hard because they're necessary. And it can be very easy, especially in America, even now to say, well, that's not my problem. I'm not this, I don't deal with that. It is important not to pass it on to other people as in, that's their problem, let them worry about that. No, we are all ultimately responsible for the way in which we live our lives, for the way that we treat people, for the ways that we um, acknowledge their hurts or fail to. And I think it is important to continue to acknowledge that racism, systematic oppression, injustice abound in our society. Far more than I think sometimes we are aware of. The only thing that we can do is educate ourselves and do our best to, in our small circles, eliminate that. I think conversation is one of the best things that can happen. I have had a lot of conversations with my family, with my friends, even up until now. And I hope to continue that 
Change is not a thing that happens overnight. We have dealt with racism and this level of oppression for 400 years in this country and beyond that in other places in the world from the beginning of time. So it will not be changed unless all of us collectively work together at changing our little communities, working at including people into our circles that we would not normally do, or striving to promote diversity or whatever, whatever it is that is lacking in our circles, striving to step out of our comfort zones and include them. I want to say that trust is also a very important element to all of this, and that is something that I'm going to get into later on in uh, the video because I, I do have a book talk for you guys and I'm very excited about it. And trust is so important and I see such a lack of it, specifically on social media, and I could get into the whole world of social media. I could do a whole nother video on that, but I will just say that trust is important. You know, we I can't specifically or personally for me, I cannot work on changing myself or learning about myself and how I, you know, either contribute or f fail to contribute uh, in a good way to the society if I'm worried about whether or not my friends are doing it. There may come times where we need to confront things in other people, but ultimately, so long as you are doing the work for yourself, you are learning and educating yourself, and if you see that in other people, I think that is where the trust comes in. There's so much more that I could say, but I think maybe providentially that the book that we're gonna be talking about today is gonna to also cover a lot of these topics. And so we'll probably, you know, hit on those during the video, but I do wanna encourage you guys, take care of yourselves, take care of your mental health, it's important. Be aware of your world and don't be af don't be afraid of it. It's a dangerous place, but there's so much beauty, so much love, so much opportunity that we can find to be better. I'm not just saying this to you as like a task for you to do. I'm also saying this to myself as an encouragement for all of us to work towards something that is bigger and better than ourselves. So the book that I'm going to be talking about today is one that I've mentioned in a previous book haul, one that I have had for a while. I knew it was amazing when I first picked it up and then I read it and I was absolutely shaken to my core, a absolutely convicted. It It's one of those books where it it is a mirror. <laughs> For you, for me, for um, our t the times that we live in, it is absolutely a mirror. And it is brilliantly written, brilliantly narrated, orchestrated, however you want to say it. And that book is Deaf Republic by Ilya Kaminsky. I had the pleasure of meeting Ilya when I went to college. I interned at a literary journal at my college and they hosted him to do a book reading. I was very, very excited. I didn't know who he was at the time. I didn't know anything about the book or him, but I was very excited. It was my very first sort of event that I'd ever been to for poetry. It could not have been the, a better introduction into poetry events like um, like it. But before we get into like the nitty gritty parts of the book, I want to talk a little bit about Ilya because his life in and of itself is quite a miracle. What he has accomplished is so inspiring. Uh, it makes me want to write more. In fact, I have written since I've read this book. I just, I think that he's an amazing person. So let's talk a little bit about the author, Ilya Kaminsky. So <clears throat> Ilya was born in the former Soviet Union in the city of Odessa. He was very young when he went deaf. There was a misdiagnosis with some health complication and he went deaf and he had to learn obviously to communicate in a different way than everybody else. And then uh, his parents moved to America when he was a teenager and his father died shortly after. And that was when he began writing poetry. And even though English is his second language, that is the language that he chose to write poetry in. And I think he said it was because he was writing about his father and I, I guess he felt that writing in a language that his family didn't understand was a way in which he could express himself freely without having to worry about them like thinking about what he was writing. 
And so that was what he did. And it, it shocks me sometimes to think that just people all over the world go around speaking and writing in different languages that are not their own. I have a hard enough time with English and you know, I do, I have learned a little bit of French in college and I love French, but um, I can't imagine writing poetry in it. Maybe I should try. I think about like, what would it be like to take a language that you are not familiar with in terms of things like creativity and artistic methods and you know, metaphor and symbolism and all of these things that all of language holds. and writing in a completely different language that has a completely different code of creativity. How, what, what is that like? It, it must be a thrilling and yet terrifying experience. And yet Ilya does it so effortlessly. It's amazing. So he um, has self-described himself as a lyric poet. It, it is very apparent in his writing. And then if you listen to him perform, it's very much like he's singing the words, which is an amazing experience to behold. This specific collection is narrative poetry, which we haven't really done a lot of um, narrative poet poetry collections on this channel. In fact, I'm trying to think back to a book that would have been narrative poetry and the only one I can think of that I might have done would have been Nikita Gill's Fierce Fairy Tales. And that wasn't like one specific story. That was more like a collection of different fairy tales. So, but this collection is one story and he writes it like a Greek tragedy, which it really like, got me in my like classical literature bone. Oh my goodness. There's a section that is called the Dramatis Personae. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. But that is, um, in all plays, there is a, a Dramatis Personae and I love plays, I love theater. And so when I saw that, I was just like, oh, this is gonna be amazing. I loved it so much. In addition to all of this raw talent and fire and passion for poetry, he has also founded Poets for Peace, which sponsors poetry reading across the globe to support relief work. I don't think he has an Instagram. I know he has a Twitter, so I'm going to put that down in the description. And I'm also gonna try and find more information about this organization that he started. Cause I think if there's any way that, you know, we can support that, I think that would be amazing. I think we're ready to get into the, the details about this book. Okay, so we're gonna start with the Dramatis Personae. Um, this is where all of the characters of this story are named and explained, um, especially in relation to each other. This is sort of a shorter version of a Greek play because I think Greek plays are usually five acts. This book is only two. Before we get into act one, Ilya does not start with act one. He starts with a poem called We Lived Happily During the War. And this takes place in America. And it is a incredibly convicting poem. He finds parallels between the conflicts that he has experienced in the Soviet Union and Ukraine, the conflicts in which we as Americans condemn. He finds parallels between those conflicts and injustices and the ones that happen in our country. And he speaks of tragedies that sound like they're out of a war zone and yet they happen on our streets. It's so different reading this in 2020 when conflict is so high and tensions are just running rampant. He speaks of soldiers in the street, dead boys, communities that are silenced, all of these things that sound like they're happening so far away and yet they're literally happening right outside our windows. It speaks of the complacency. You could even go as far as the idea of white supremacy and how complacent white people have been in the past and even now of the idea of racial injustice and systematic oppression. The idea of ignorance and how it is so deep in our society that you could stare at a video that shows a murder and think that it's okay. That level of ignorance and, and complacency. We Live Happily During the War begins with the idea that we are living in a war, even in America, where we champion or are supposed to champion peace and freedom. He akins the tensions, racial tensions to a war and he says that we 
lived happily in it. Reading that was like a massive slap in the face, in a good way. I don't mean that in like an insulting way. I mean that in like, he is really going to expose all of us for being okay with the way that the world has gone. Right from the get-go, I knew, okay, we're definitely going to be in for um, kind of a reckoning in this book. Our first two characters that are really expanded on in Act 1 is this couple. Their names are Alfonso and Sonia. We meet them through the eyes of the town. The townspeople are the equivalent of a Greek chorus in a Greek play, which they would give the reactions of the audience of the other characters. They would portray the emotions of the surrounding people as they watch the what is happening on stage. And so in this setting, the townspeople are the chorus and they introduce us to Alfonso and Sonia in the wake of a tragedy. So in act one, as I said, uh, the townspeople, the chorus introduces us to our main characters, Sonia and Alfonso, and there is a tragedy. Someone has been killed. And because this is a story, I'm not going to spoil everything in it for you. I don't want to ruin the experience for you by spoiling it. But I will say it does start with the death of someone who is very close to Sonia. And the townspeople, the town of Vicenka, reacts to this tragedy, to this injustice by going deaf. They can no longer hear. They find different ways to communicate, but they can no longer hear. I think the reality is if this tragedy had never occurred, we would never have been introduced to Sonia or Alfonso to begin with. And I think that's a really interesting way that he has presented us with our main characters as, as in a lot of times without the tragedy, we do not see people. And that is in and of itself a deep conviction. We see this couple who must learn to grieve in a time of political and military tension. Sonia is pregnant and she has had to witness this death during her pregnancy. It's a very conflicting time for her and Alfonso. And yet, and yet, even with all of these reasons to be, to close oneself off or to react in hatred, she responds in kindness. And Alfonso reacts to this in awe because he loves this woman and he sees how strong she actually is and he sometimes is in awe of the fact that he's married to her and that um, they are having a child together and there are a lot of, there are a lot of poems in the first act that speak of uh, his awe of her of the fact that he's so happy that to be with her um, and yet it is always in the background tinged with this fear that one day it's all going to be taken away um, because they do not live in happy times. She eventually does have her baby, a little baby girl. Once again, Alfonso is awed by her humanity um, and the fact that she has brought a life into this world. I think he's expressing the surreal feelings of being alive in a time of war. And I think that's the brilliance of this of this book, to be honest, um, the way that he's able to express all of these little things that still go on despite this overarching war or harm that is happening to everyone. These little lives are still so important and he's showing us that we are these people. These are our little lives that we have to learn to, to live even in our struggles. I think he beautifully manages to capture all of the ethereal parts of true humanity in conflict. We see different we see all of the all of the different shades of humanity. We see the darkness of the soldiers that are coming into this town to wreak havoc and warmonger these poor people. We see the people respond in various ways with anger, with silence, with grief, with happiness, with joy, with love, all of these things that we see. And he captures the resilience of everyday people to find ways to survive. And I, it really, it really blows me away. 
In Act 2, the town focuses on a different character. Her name is Mama Gala, and she is amazing. She's a puppet theater owner, and I have had to do a little research because of the way that puppet theater is portrayed. And I still I still can't find any definitive proof of this. I just I'm going kind of off of what the book implies that yes, uh, she does do a lot of puppetry and she has a whole cast of people who do puppetry. Um, but it does seem to to be the case that it also is somewhat a brothel or um, maybe just a place where people kind of go to get off. And so um, that besides the point, she is a force to be reckoned with. She's 53, she's brave, she's courageous, and they state, the, the, our very first introduction to her is that she is having more sex than anybody else in that town. It is, it's really interesting because sex, it, sex is brought up in the first act, specifically between Sonia and Alfonso, and sort of marveling in the feeling of being loved when all around you seems to be filled with this hatred. But sex uh, comes up in the second act in a completely different way. It's sort of a more free, fierce, at times weaponized thing. But Mama Gala is unashamed, unafraid. She's living her life. Um, and I don't mean that in like a flamboyant, flippant way. I mean that it's like, a defiant pleasure of like, I understand that the world is falling apart around me, but they will not rid me of my pleasure. It's a, it's a defiance against the injustice, if that makes sense. And the enemy, the soldiers also happen to find her seductive, which keeps her alive. She is not only a leader, uh, somewhat in the town, maybe an unofficial leader. She is a rescuer. She rescues a baby in the most courageous way by stealing her away in a laundry basket so that the soldiers wouldn't see. And she takes care of her. She she becomes her guardian. She um, feeds her. She clothes her. She is there for her first steps. Everything that that child does, she is there for her. This is where I want to talk about community. I've heard a lot of talk about community in social media. The idea that we are defunding the police to pour the money into communities. And I think that is a great thing that um, should definitely be pursued. However, the idea of community is something that has always fascinated me just because the communities that I see people talk about, especially in the past, they don't exist now in our modern capitalist world. So communities are gonna have to look different now. But I think at the core, the beauty of a true community is that there are always people to take care of each other. This child is orphaned, but she has taken it upon herself to take care of this child. That idea that it takes a village, that's the reason. Because if for whatever reason there is a tragedy or a deficiency somewhere, someone is always there to be like, no, I got you. You don't have to worry about that. Your family, taken care of. We're there for them. So Ilya beautifully, and it's not, it's not an obvious thing. It's just, he is describing the way that this town works. Just, this is how it is. If there is a child that needs something, they will, it will be provided. Somebody will take care of it. I wrote down that it is to experience and endure, to mourn, protect, to rescue, to care for one another, regardless of who you are. We are all in this together. In Deaf Republic, trust, this idea of community is very, very strong. In Act Two, um, back to the idea of a sex, one way in which they sort of openly rebel is that the sex is weaponized because the soldiers come to the women of the puppet theater, including Mama Gala, and uh, you know things happen, and then the women use that as a way of getting their guard down, and then they kill them, and that is a Come, that is an absolute clear rebellion. That is a fighting back. And we see that they are using the, we the, the weaknesses of the enemy against them as, as in any war. So there is a fighting back, a physical fighting back in which they find weakness and exploit it. Survival requires a lot of giving up of who we thought we were. And you know, Ilya shows that as well. The idea of survival of like, well, we're in a fight here, you know, we can't afford, 
the moral high ground has left us when that boy died, you know? So we have to find a way to fight back. It's not about, in this case, it's not necessarily about right or wrong. It's about survival. And Ilya manages to express that in a very sort of graphic way. However, because I do feel like this is a tragedy, he doesn't mean this to have a happy ending. The soldiers catch on to what the women are doing in the puppet theater. And of course they retaliate. And once the town begins to see the harshness of the retribution, they turn on Mama Gala. And she is begging them to see it from her point of view, to understand and Unfortunately, in the face of torture and death even, people are not willing to. And that is an incontestable fact. You know, people are bound to be upset if you put their life in jeopardy, even if it is for the cause of justice or survival or whatever the case may be. And so Mama Gala has to come to those grips that, oh my gosh, well, I've kind of lost the support of the people who I'm trying to protect. It's a very hard, difficult place to be. And she sees how this this rejection has divided her people. And it feels, it feels really close to home to see how things can divide people. And when we are divided, it pushes us further into our differences. And so eventually the soldiers do take over. It ends tragically. And all through this, there have been talk of puppets because of Mama Gala and also Sonia and Alfonso are puppeteers. So there's always been this um, idea of puppets. And in the end, they are the only ones there to silently voice their rebellion. He ends this book once again in America. The last poem is called In a Time of Peace. This is, I feel, more of Ilya's observations but from any oppressed group of people, the observations and the point of view of, of those oppressed people. He, he has just described to us a country or a place. He doesn't, Vicenka is a fictional place, but he has just described and shown us a place that is in physical, in your face conflict. There are soldiers that are always there. And he has described for us a place that is not peaceful. And then he goes into this last poem called In a Time of Peace, in which he, re he shows up the irony that America is supposed to be a peaceful country. We are not with, at, at a war within, supposedly. And yet he sees people die because of the color of their skin. And he keeps repeating in between these instances, but we're a peaceful country. Yet another instance. We're a peaceful country, yet this is happening. And just the juxtaposition of those two views, um, or realities, I should say, and how um, how we, we kind of live with that cognitive dissonance, if I can put it that way. He's not saying that our lives mean nothing if we are not actively fighting physically against this oppression. He acknowledges that all of our lives have meaning and we are always going to have to take care of the little things in our lives. But I don't think it means that we can ignore all of the, the big things um, that are happening in our world that are either a direct result of our complacency and ignorance or um, a, coping a coping mechanism to ignore that. So that is sort of the explanation of the book. I know that was very long-winded, but I feel like I can't do it any other way without di like diminishing the importance of this book. There are a couple really cool things physically about Deaf Republic that I really loved. So throughout the book, there are little pages and little moments where he includes some sign language, which is a whole nother language, which is awesome. And um, I went ahead and labeled it for myself. So, um, but all, and but throughout the book, he labels them and, you know, says what they mean. I think this is an incredibly relevant book for 2020 specifically. This book was published last year. I would definitely recommend it for this year. It is hopeful in, in small ways. I think it presents its hope not by completely crushing it, but by showing you 
the world is is a very dark place. Maybe it always has been. But in every dark place, there are people who are human and who are loving and who are compassionate, who will find ways to show other people what it's like to be included, to be loved, to be taken care of. That to me is the most hopeful thing that I can take away. And it's been such a, an honor to read this book and to know that this man is still out there, still writing, that he is creating spaces in which we don't shy away from tragedy, but we find ways to be human in it. So I hope that you enjoyed in this video. The books that I'm actually reading currently and are planning to read also talk about these topics and expand more on them. So this is not going to be the last video in which we talk about um, all of these very serious and important issues. I want to encourage you to step out of your comfort zone when it comes to things like literature um, and reading because I think that's one of the best ways that we can learn about other people and other cultures. Even if we can't physically go to different places right now, books are a way in which we can still have those experiences. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will put all of Ilya's, uh, as much information about Ilya Kaminsky that I can find in the description below. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. Um, I would love to see you guys head over there and give me a follow and tell me more about your experiences with poetry. Uh, if you have any poetry that you would like me to read, please tell me about it. I do have kind of a queue uh, of poetry that I need to read for people who have sent me their work, but um, I will just add you to the list and then we will I will get to it and I'll let you know what I think about it. As always, I hope that you stay healthy. I hope that you find ways to ease your anxieties or your tensions or whatever it is. Uh, I hope that you find ways to be happy even in this really dumpster fire of a year. <laughs> I hope that even in these dark times, you will find hope. Uh, I will see you guys in my next video. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.